It's a pleasure for me to welcome my former neighbor and a good friend for many years, Jens Bölke from Owens Corning. He is the Global Wind Protrusion Manager at Owens Corning. The title of his presentation is Protrusion, an answer to design to build better and more sustainable wind blades. Jens, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. It's good? Yeah, everybody hears me? Perfect. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Uh, thanks for the chance to be here, seeing a lot of friends, former colleagues, companies I worked for, like German Aerospace Center. Good presentation, by the way. Um, so I'm here for, for talking about protrusion. Um, I'm happy to be still in the program because I switched the companies in between. <laughs> I've, I've been in the program as well with my former company, but that's the reason why I will show some stuff about that as well, um, because there's a corporation still ongoing. Um, so there is... Hast du das mitgenommen? Das? Good. So, um, let me talk about protrusion in wind, why in wind, and um, what makes it so efficient to use protrusion instead of, which is a great big business for us as well, using fabrics. Um, there is a reason for it. Uh, we see longer blades and that stuff, and I will elaborate on that. Um, so just about on scoring, I don't like these, these company uh, slides, so that's why I will be very fast on these things. Um, so on scoring, it is not perfectly true what is here. We are now exactly 20,000 people working uh, in three different fields. Uh, on scoring is not well known in Europe, um, but in the US more. You, you see the pink panther in the middle. The pink panther is our kind of uh, logo part. Um, Owens Corning has kind of a, as an insulation company, everybody could, could guess that we have worked with asbestos in the past, so they needed to do something for their reputation. <laughs> and that's why they purchased uh, Pink Panther from, I think, MGM Studios. Um, so I think the revenue is quite nice uh, for, for, for this size of a company. Uh, we are uh, having a lot of operations globally. Um, if we talk about wind, uh, we are in, the main, in all the main regions where you will find... Uh, wind energy production, which is uh, Europe. We have Spain, France, uh, many facilities. We have um, them in the US, we have them in Brazil, uh, China, India. These are the main spots today for, for wind energy, so we are located there. The three pillars we are working on is roofing, as I said, uh, is a part uh, where we do these shingles. So everybody who's seen an American movie, seeing these grayish black shingles on the roofs, these are like 80% from Owens Corning. Um, the other pillar is insulation. So we know in Europe more probably isofer from Saint-Gobain, which is com competitor, but we are staying away from that business in Europe. So that's why Saint-Gobain is big. Um, but we are doing that in the US. And the third pillar, more globally uh, well known, is, is uh, composites. Um, with a big proportion of wind. So all these share of the revenue share around one third. So composites and wind takes like 50% of our composites revenue. Um, that's very small. So that's what I was talking about, the very quite, quite well distributed uh, footprint worldwide. Um, let's see when Africa will follow. So what we are doing is, um, first of all, glass manufacturing. So we are having a very long history of, of glass manufacturing, starting with I think it's called glass blowing, uh, and they found out that small pieces had quite a very nice property. So Owens and Corning, they stick together and said, okay, let's, let's found a company to make glass fibers. So that's still the core business, including all the fabrics and veils and stuff like that, which you require for the different reinforcements. Um, there's a newly established modeling um, part within the company, a department, taking care of different customer projects. We have uh, a lot of things to do in digitalization. I think these are the typical buzzwords uh, today, um, but we will have more of these. Um, sizing binder coatings are for sure the part which makes the fibers interesting uh, to be really adhe adhesive to, to, to some glues or to infusion resins. Um, we are taking care a lot of, uh, in, the, in regards to customer productivity, I will show a lot of uh, things in that regards. And for sure, the topic of today, circular economy, is a big part. And the interesting part for, from Owen's Corning perspective, I was quite impressed to hear that we have a CSO. Everybody knows a CSO as a sales officer. Um, we have a sustainability officer. So there's one guy in the board of our managers just taking care of sustainability. 
and uh, that shows that this topic is taken very serious in, in Owen Scorning. So coming to wind energy, I mean, for sure, the, as I was talking about insulation and that stuff, uh, as well in composites, building and construction is one of the main pillars besides uh, infrastructure and wind. And right now we are talking about more about wind. So what, is, what are the drivers today? The drivers are that we require longer blades. I think we have all seen the last 20 to 30 years, nobody believed that we will stand in front of blades or the full turbine diameter of 250 meters on already. Um, so right now we are having blades up to 110, 112, 150 meters. Last week was announced by a Chinese uh, company, 107 meters blade. And there is a lot of amount of glass fibers involved and for sure carbon fiber as well. So they are getting longer. That's why we need to, to define new glass fibers as well. And I will show that uh, within some minutes. Uh, we have one big topic for these huge blades. You have high cycle times. The molds for these blades are very expensive and you need to reduce the cycle times. Um, that's why more and more is done to have some prefabricated parts. We talked about preforms, pre-shapes, we call them, um, and so on, as well as protrusion. Um, and for sure, the greener part, uh, which is highlighted in the next slide, um, where we are working, for example, on a huge project with uh, LM Wind Power, besides others, um, to make, in this case, a thermoplastic-based uh, wind blade. Um, as I said, sustainability is one of the core things and within Owens Corning. We have some facilities already running with 100% um, renewable energy um, and very engaged in the different projects. We are joining other projects are right now in the wind industry. We heard about fiber reuse and, and CTEC projects and these things. So there's a lot of stuff going on from the different, mainly right now the, the resin suppliers, they need to do the job first because then we can get the fibers back and do something with the fibers. And some of the ideas are probably to really bring them back to the raw material cycle and to add them into the furnace again to make new fibers from it. Probably not, not just remelt them like, like we know it from aluminum, but to, to inject them into the flow of glass within a um, furnace is possible. So as I said, the blades uh, nearly grew like three times over the last decade which is unbelievable. If I always pass the Autobahn in Stade, I see the small ones from some years back, like 20, 25 meters, and as I said today, more than 100 meters. Um, seeing a mold where one guy is operating uh, in the mold, it's, it's like uh, a six meter roof, a root dimension right now. So uh, unbelievably huge, and that requires new materials, um, and for sure, lower cycle times, as I said before, and this is why I'm going to tell you about why protrusion meets wind. Um, protrusion meets wind because we have seen over the last years, or we are actually right now we see it, there was one big OEM starting with protrusion. They started protrusion using carbon composites. Um, but we see, as I, that's what, why it was the reason for the question for, for Dirk, uh, because we have um, seen a lot of availability issues right now for carbon, even if there are a lot of uh, Chinese suppliers right now setting up new poly nitrile and uh, furnaces for, for making carbon. But um, with the adoption of, of protrusion, mainly Vestas, um, everybody started to look into that direction. And what you see here is really the, the curve for all these fabrics being used in the spar cap is going down, and one of the main reasons is protrusion is perfectly fitting for, for a spar cap girder, because you need to take tension and compression, and the fibers are perfectly straight, with a perfect distribution, homogeneity, and that's one of, one of the reasons. I will show the second reason as well, um, or it's, it's, it's in here already, so the fiber volume fraction is quite high. Uh, normally in an infusion you would have 55%. So we can, with protrusion, add uh, fibers to have around 70% of fiber volume fraction. And that really brings a lot of uh, E-modulus to the blade and helps to reduce thickness of spar caps and finally make the blade lighter. Or if you want to keep the same thickness of the spar cap, you can make them longer. These are the two, two things. Um, and for sure, adding more fibers helps you to consume less resin. My resin friends don't like that, but uh, it is what it is. and, and uh, Fibers are much less expensive than, than resins, so this helps as well. Um, 
And as I said, so the, probably we will see fabrics in the spar cap vanishing within the next 10 years. This is probably for smaller blades, some guys like it. Um, and always we have some conservative guys uh, who don't want to adopt it, but uh, I think there's nearly no, and I'm talking to all of them, them or no OEM not considering to use protrusion right now. My job is to convince them to go back from carbon to glass. This is one of the reasons why I'm in the company. Um, and actually, due to the availability I was asking for, we definitely see in wind the, the take-up of, of, of carbon is, is quite high, and I will show uh, or explain a little bit more about that soon. Um, so how is it done? This is probably one of the things I'm talking here. Here's a big big shadow around that foggy area, uh, talking about a spark cap. What, what is it? Um, it's finally a very kind of easy type of profile made with protrusion, protrusion known like winding, one of the high productivity solutions for high volumes. Um, what we do is we protrude mainly five millimeters planks. The planks are covered with a peel ply, which we don't like. Um, and then we are stacking them together, as you can see here in the middle of the slide. Um, and then there are two ways. You put the stack into the main mold or you put the stack into a kind of secondary mold just for making the spar cap and then you marry it with the fabrics and then you have a co-infusion. Um, the, from in, in the length direction, it looks like that. You need to chamfer this due to some, how do you say, uh, stress drops if you don't do this, this. And then, as I said, it's finally laid up into the blade and uh, creating the compression and uh, tensile strength for the blade. And for sure, for the bending forces, because you have kind of the deflection, you require to have the blade far away enough from, from, from the tower, because if something happens there, uh, it might be a catastrophic failure. This is one of the slides I'm always trying to con convince people with. And uh, I started with 80 meters here in the middle with the arrows. Um, right now we are at 95, and the Chinese companies are proving us wrong right now. They have made the last blade, for example, on the compression side, uh, 107 meters. They already use kind of a hybrid design of the girders or the spar caps. They use the compression one in glass and the, the, the one which is under tension in carbon, which makes actually sense because the compression side is more related to, to buckling, buckling with carbon. We have uh, Richard Degenhardt from DLA knows that better than me, um, that there is an issue and that's why it's quite a very smart approach from them. And that's why I say, okay, there's for sure, there's a clear kind of difference onshore, mainly glass in the future, offshore mainly carbon, but with some proportions from both in each other direction. So narrow blade designs, we see them from Vestas, we see them uh, in Nordex. Um, they may use carbon planks as well. Um, nevertheless, for sure, with the impact of cost. Um, and and for, for some... Five minutes? Good. <laughs> um, and for, for some, for some uh, very long blades in offshore, we see it in the trailing edge girder and, uh, as I said, on the suction side where the compression happens in the spar cap. So there is... And, and honestly, I heard a presentation last week. If we consider offshore to grow as it is meant to grow, we will see all material produced today from carbon in the offshore sector. So there is nothing, nearly nothing left for the onshore. And this is the big issue, and this is why I say I'm not talking against carbon. I think there's a coexistence we require to, to really fit the demands which are required for the next years. And I talked about that 24, the market will have a takeoff. Right now we are in a flat area, but it will have a takeoff, and this takeoff, takeoff uh, lasts an, at least 10 years. And this will be the bright years of, of, of wind energy for sure and hopefully Länger. So then I asked Bob Dylan for, for something, and he, we, we gave him H3 for, for that because he need, needed something new. Um, that's just the fun part here. So H3, why do we do H3? And we announced that at JEC. I talked about higher fiber, fiber volume fraction, you see here. Um, if we are talking about lower fiber volume fraction and ultra blade in the top left, you see that um, uses a fabric and we right now use protruded parts, parts and with the protruded parts, ultras by one, two, three, we can see that there is a 5% increase in the E-modulus, so we are right now talking about 66 gigapascals, a little bit more, 
than 66, which is nearly halfway of carbon. So uh, carbon, we see the planks mainly in the area of 135 to 140 um, gigapascals. So we are getting closer. Um, and this is really what helps the designers to design blades um, with glass as well. And for sure, the conductivity is it's much, it's much less than carbon. For carbon, you have a lot of lightning protection you need. And um, for glass, you can use the standard one as it's known, and it's much less expensive than, than uh, for carbon. And talking about sustainability again, I will always uh, circul uh, circulate around that topic. Uh, the um, impact of glass or glass production is much less than for carbon, um, which is as well part of the sustainability we are highlighting. And uh, then it comes to the one first, last or second last uh, slide. So what, what do we do right now to really show the market that we are willing to protrude? I talked about we are a glass producer, so it's a big step for Owens Corning. And this is actually the reason why they hired me to go into part production, in this case, protrusion. And um, we are right now starting to set up facilities, or we have facilities already, um, where we have protrusion machines. We are purchasing the first pull cube. Probably some know that I have a little bit relation to that uh, before. Um, so we have our exclusive license partner for the wind industry from pull cube, which is a very high productivity machine. I will show one slide afterwards. Um, so we are setting up stuff in China. We are setting up uh, things in Chambéry in France. And uh, then let's see where we start doing the first industrialization because the technology rollout will take place this year and next year. That's what is required. And that's why I need within five minutes after my speech to go to the next, uh, exactly for that topic, to the next uh, meeting. Um, because this is right now really, we have 18 months left before the takeoff. That's why we are really taking it serious and, and speeding up. Pull cube, why pull cube? Just to give a slight overview about that. And this is again, coming back to sustainability. This is, the system is very sustainable. We have less waste for the product, within production, all the setups, short, short machine make absolutely sense to, to uh, reduce waste, um, as well as it's a fully electric machine. I just have been there yesterday. Um, the fully electric, fully electric machine consumes a lot of less uh, energy. Uh, and we have seen when, within a, a trial we made with uh, Olin, I'm still working with these guys, uh, Olin Epoxy from Stade, Gunnar knows them better than I. Um, they, are, they, had, uh, they found out that, that pull cube gives us a very high productivity with still a very good um, surface quality or plank quality, which is, not, um, which is not the case for a standard protrusion line. So we are at least able to run 50 times, uh, 50 percent faster, 50 percent faster than a standard protrusion line, which then in the end is for us probably margin or lower cost approach for, for customers. And with that, I want to thank you for listening to my speech. Yeah, thank you, Jens. It's really fascinating to see what came out of Pull Cube mm -hmm. because that was basically your baby. Yeah, so yep. I must say. Yeah. So, any questions? So we are all tired. Yeah, is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Herr Wiedemann. Maybe. Yeah. yeah maybe Professor one, Wiedemann. One question. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very. Interesting presentation. Uh, regarding the, the, the properties of these uh, improved glass fibers, you mentioned 66 megapascal, uh, gigapascal stiffness. What is the idea, what can you reach in the end? What is the best capability of glass fiber you, you would predict? If we would just use fibers, 95. <laughs> 95? Yeah, so the, fi 95 the fiber itself has, has 95 gigapascal. Um, but we need to have some resin still because of fatigue and all these other performance, compression. So the fibers in the mix with at 70% fiber volume fraction, we are at 66, 67. Um, but I know my company is working on different new high modulus glasses, so let's see what happens. Um, are you also working on recycling issues of glass? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a big topic for us right now, so we are uh, reusing pyrolyzed fibers, for example. We are engaged in projects where they do uh, solvolysis um, for, of, 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 of resins, because we first need to get rid of the resin, then we can get the fibers back. Um, but the big topics are, is there still sizing on it? Do we have some contaminations? 
and how can we reuse them? Is it a kind of repurposing to probably isolation because insulation? Is it is it better to use it there because you don't get the same properties as before? Um, at some point it will be like that, uh, but but a lot of stuff can go into veils, mats, and stuff like that to really reuse them and probably for very long fibers as well to to reuse them in in other. Um, yeah, for high, high property applications. I mean, if you get rid of the matrix, can you remelt uh, the fibers? Yeah, this is an idea. This is an idea, and and this then I mean then we will be in the area of an aluminum. Yeah. Uh, that would be perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's the idea to really re-inject them into the furnace, but um, this is this has to be proven that it works uh, because I think then we will have the same issue like in aluminum, in titan, titanium, and stuff like that, where we really need to. All the different H glasses, for example, we have, Advantix glasses, we need to divide them perfectly and then have them back. Um, and there are old blades with very old materials where there's some boret in it and stuff like that, which is not, not allowed anymore. So we need to take care of a good waste uh, sorting. Okay, that's the next question. Yes, thank you for your presentation. And then you mentioned that you prefer carbon fiber uh, instead of, uh, no, instead of, so you prefer uh, glass fiber instead of. <laughs> Uh, carbon fiber, and uh, as far as I know, the carbon fiber, especially because of the pre because of the precursor, is very much dependent on the export decisions from China. Yeah. And what is your assessment that uh, Europe could uh, sustain itself with glass fiber if the supply chain from uh, carbon fiber would be in question? I mean, finally, the. the there's really, really the availability issue is there, and I think it will come to the race who pays more. This is what, what I see for, for carbon. And we are right now still already at one-tenth of the price of a carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, first of all, the designers need to make the job. In China, they already did. They have had smart approaches, as I said, already using a lot of glass protrusion. Uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, not yet. Mm -hmm. We start talking with them, uh, or have started some, some months back. So I think it is really the adoption of how to make a glass bar cap and mm -hmm. how to make a blade from glass bar caps. Um, because within glass, there will be not be a big issue for having availability of glass fibers. But for carbon fiber, with the takeoff, we will see in the next mm -hmm. years, even if the Chinese are adding, and we had the very nice Composites United report for carbon fibers some weeks ago, and there you see they are adding a lot of capacities, but they are not enough. And mm -hmm. this is why there needs to be more glass adoption, because uh, I once met a guy from, from a big carbon supplier, and he told me they are producing as much as Owens Corning is shoveling out of the facility from the floor. Yeah. So yeah. this is the part. Thank you. Welcome. OK, maybe one more last question. That is not the case. Then uh, Jens, thank you very much. I know that you are heading for the next meeting, so applause for Jens. And then thank you. I see you. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Now. Thank you.